So welcome to the first afternoon session of this training school and we continue the series of interesting talks with an other interesting one given by Erez Nasharim from Technion and he will speak about Schmidt games and applications in dynamics and number theory. Erez, the stage is yours. Erez? Okay. Erez, I just introduced you, so you can start ah. your talk if you, yes. if you mind. Okay, thank you. Let me just, uh, something just happened. I, I was kicked off. Not by me, not by me for sure. Uh, it, chef, no, it was related to the to the recording somehow. We see you. Okay, so you see me and you hear me? Yeah. So thank you very much for inviting me and. Uh, oh, no Thank you very much for the organizing this con this training school, and thank you very much for for coming to the talk. Um, I'm going to repeat what Arkady said about how uh, pleasure it is for me to to be here, and how how I'm ha honored to speak here. Um, so I'm going to talk about Schmidt games, and maybe the the talk will have a slightly uh, different flavor from the previous talks, but uh, definitely related. I, I enjoyed very much uh, the previous talks and uh, looking forward for tomorrow and the day after. Um, and I will also try to be playful uh, in my talk, so, so you can feel free to, to interrupt me whenever you want. Um, so the interest in applications of game theory to number theory and dynamics uh, started um, with Schmidt, Wolfgang Schmidt. And he um, realized that uh, some natural sets uh, that are studied in number theory and dynamics are best described uh, using games. Um, then he had many interesting questions that and some of them in some in some cases the breakthroughs towards interesting questions in number theory and dynamics came from better understanding of the game theory that is involved so um, um, it's very probable it's very likely it could be the, that uh, also the next breakthrough will come from a better understanding of the game theory that is involved. And uh, this is why I'm very happy to, to speak in this conference and very happy to see that uh, uh, people in, in game theory are interested in applications. Uh, so, so the interest in, in is mutual. Uh, okay, so, so I'll talk about Schmidt's game, the original game, and then about uh, maybe a slightly more, uh, suitable <clears throat> version and then I will I will invest most of my time in, in two applications in dynamics and number theory and later I will talk about two classical applications and then later I will talk about uh, a more advanced or more recent uh, game and uh, maybe just mention the generalizations of, of those uh, applications. So. So Schmidt's game is played on, on a metric, on a complete metric space. Um, <clears throat> it's common to, to, to call the players in this field uh, from some time on, it, it became common to call them Alice and Bob. And they have uh, each, each of them have a, a parameter, alpha, alpha and beta. And the alpha beta game is, is played, uh, is an alternating move game. Uh, where Bob starts and he picks uh, a starting ball, uh, and then Alice chooses a, a ball inside the, that ball. 
uh, and the radius of that ball should be should be um, alpha times the radius of the previous of, of Bob's ball, and then Bob chooses a ball inside Alice's ball whose radius is uh, beta times the radius of the ball of of Alice, and then in the end there is an outcome. Uh, so the intersection of all those balls, since this is a complete metric space, there is a point and that is the outcome. Um, so let me, let me draw this in a picture. Um, so this is the first time I'm, I'm giving a talk, um, this kind of a hybrid talk, not-, not uh, Can you bring the previous slide just to remember the- uh, Maybe, yeah, I'm just going to draw the picture ah, now okay. so it will become- what? Uh, I, I see, okay. I wanted to notice the difference in the power, the, the different roles that alpha and beta are playing. Yes. Okay. Yes. So there is B0 and then, so yeah, so this is the first time I'm giving this kind of a hybrid talk. So, so hopefully it will not be very bad. Uh, so this is A1. Um, and the radius of A1 is alpha times R0. The radius of, of B0 is, is uh, R0. And then inside A1, Bob has to choose a ball of radius uh, beta times alpha times R0. This would be B1 and the game goes on. So, so in, the, and in the end, there is a... In the end, there is a point, and that is the outcome. Uh, so this this falls into the category of, of uh, games, as as Arkady mentioned in his talk. Uh, those those topological games, or uh, most more more specifically, those those met games played on a metric space, they they fall into the category of, of games that are studied in in Martin's uh, theorem. Um, and um, okay, so. One thing to notice, uh, okay, so, and, and then now a, a set is called winning. So a subset of the space is called winning if there are, it's, it's called alpha beta winning if uh, Alice has a strategy which makes sure that, uh, that the outcomes, that the outcome is in S. So th those type of winning sets, they are not very nice um, if you fix alpha and beta. Um, it's easy to, to see that they are dense. If, if, S is, if, uh, if S is winning, if S is alpha beta winning, then obviously it is dense because uh, no matter, uh, Bob can choose his first ball arbitrarily. arbitrarily. So, and in, if Alice can make sure that the some point in this ball is, is, uh, is in the set S, then S must be dense because it has a point in every ball. But, um, for example, uh, Chris Freiling gave a, an interesting uh, example of a set that is one half, one half winning, but not one third, one half winning. So this is this is a bit uh, misleading because you you may think that um, being winning with a smaller parameter is is harder because uh, Alice, in order to make sure that the point that the outcome is in, in her set, she must shrink towards the towards that point in a in a in a faster. So if if the if the if alpha is smaller, then she can do it faster. And then uh, may, maybe it means that uh, being alpha beta winning with, with smaller alpha is, is stronger than being alpha uh, with them with a, par a larger parameter, but this is so. This is a, a bit misleading. But uh, anyway, we'll not we'll not touch this because we'll have this better behaved uh, alpha winning property, where Bob there is actually allowed. May, may I ask a question at this point? Yes. Sure. So uh, alpha, is it um, so? Does Alice have to choose exactly the, the ball of exactly radius alpha times the ball of Bob, or is alpha an upper bound on the radius? Um, 
No, if alpha is an upper bound, then this is uh, not interesting. I mean, this, this will give it too much power. This will be like the Banach Mazur game. So here you, you want to restrict. There, there are versions of this game where Alice can actually choose a bigger, a slightly bigger ball. Like a, alpha would be a lower bound on the ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those type of games, they, they behave a bit better, but uh, it's even harder to prove things about them. And uh, I don't want to get into uh, all the versions of Schmidt games, there are many. So unfortunately okay. I will not be able to touch Elon asked me to touch the, the dimension game, but I will not be able to, I will not uh, talk about that, but that, that could be like for later maybe. Um, more questions? Uh, okay, so a set is alpha winning if, if Bob can, if no matter what, Bob, what, what beta, what beta is, um, it is alpha beta winning. So, um, in other words, you can you can think of it as uh, allowing Bob to make in his first move of the game. He can also choose better. Uh, he can choose better once and for all. Not he can choose better you... once and for all. Yeah, okay. in the first move of the game. Yeah. And uh, since we are interested in in the, in the, in the um, well. Coming days, we are going to be interested in, in uh, games with values. Then I can say that uh, you can define the winning dimension. This is defined by Schmidt of S to be the supremum over all alpha, such that uh, S is uh, alpha winning. And uh, and then you can even allow Alice in, in the first move of the game to choose alpha. And then she, she will have to choose alpha wisely, not to choose it too, too large because then it might be not winning and then uh, there will be some supremum. So actually it's, it's an interesting, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, question to, that was not uh, in the attention uh, for, for some time, or maybe it was known as a folklore that uh, the supremum is actually achieved. So, in the literature, there, there are many sets that are that are proved to be one that are proved to be alpha winning for every alpha that is smaller than one half because this is easier to work with than with alpha that is strictly smaller than one half because if you allow if you allow um, in in the case alpha equals one half you must it yeah if there is a ball and the alpha it, Alice has to choose a ball that is uh, exactly one half in, in the radius, then it must contain the center of the previous ball. So, so this way, yeah, it's a bit uh, annoying to, to work with. So people, people usually prove that uh, sets are uh, alpha winning for, for every alpha that is smaller than one half, but then there is a general result that tells you, well, not a general result, but there is a result that tells you that actually you can also win with, with one half. I don't, I don't know if this follows from any abstract game theory result. So, uh, Erez, is it clear that uh, for every set S there is an alpha for which the set is alpha winning? Um... I guess if alpha is zero, then uh, Alice can just uh, write. Ah, alpha is not zero. Maybe maybe we can allow alpha to be zero. Then and then, if alpha is zero, then just yeah. just put, choose the center. But uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. If, if you're not allowed alpha alpha equals zero, then most sets are not are not winning. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, so, so this is the main property that led actually to Schmidt's uh, interest in game theory. Um, is that if there are countably many alpha winning sets, then the intersection is also alpha winning. Since, the, and since alpha winning sets are dense, uh, this, this would mean that, uh, yeah, that at least the, in particular, it's not empty. So, so if you want to prove uh, that something 
yeah, that some number, for example, have infinitely many, can't be many properties, then you might as well prove that the, the property is, is winning. Obviously, you may think of other ways to do that, like a category and measure, like proving that the set has full measure, then the intersection also has a full measure. But in this case, uh, the sets that he, were he was interested in, they were actually small in, in the other term, in the other uh, sense. So they were, they had zero Lebesgue measure, for example, and they were uh, first category. So, but they were, they are still large sets. And the proof is, uh, is very insi insightful. Uh, you just play the game, like you, you just play a simultaneous game um, using the strategy, the winning strategies of Alice uh, for each and every set. So, so the, the, the picture to think of is that uh, you fix some winning strategies for Alice for each of the, se of each of the sets. And then on the first move, you play the, according to the winning strategy of Alice for, for S1. And then on the second move, you play the winning strategy for S2. And the third move, you play again, the winning strategy for, for, for S1. And you do this uh, nice, uh, uh, shuffle. So you make sure that you play every strategy infinitely, infinitely often. So here the distance between the, between the appearance of ones is, is two and the distance between appearance of twos is, uh, is four. And the distance between appearance of three is, uh, is eight and so on. And uh, maybe there are more things to say here, but uh, since we are dealing with alpha winning sets, then it means that you are alpha beta winning for every beta. So you might as well think of, well, the jump from here to here, sorry. The jump from here to here, for example, uh, the balls shrink by alpha to the, alpha to the eight, beta to the eight. So, so you might, okay, you, you, may, you may think of this as being Bob's ball in, in, the, in the alpha, uh, alpha to the seventh, beta to the eighth game. And then Alice would just have to make, have to make uh, her move, uh, this move, and then this would fit. So, so it doesn't matter what happened between the two appearances of, of three. Okay, maybe this is standard uh, thing in, in, in game theory. Uh, let, let me know if I'm, I'm too elabor I'm elaborating too much or, or if this is... Uh... Elon, you, you, you don't look happy. Yeah. I, I, I don't uh, follow the proof. I do not know whether the others do, but for me okay. somehow uh, the fact that you apply uh, the optimal, the winning strategy of S3 every eight times, where alpha was shrinked by alpha to the power seven or eight, it doesn't really matter, but not with the alpha. So I don't see. Yeah. yeah, the alpha remains, the alpha stays. So I only uh, know how to. Okay, so, so you add it to the beta. beta. Yeah, beta yeah. prime is, uh, so I, I, I'm using the alpha beta prime. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, strategy. Yeah, okay. Then at least for me, it's fine now. But I do not know about the others. Are you um, are you forgetting a part of the history here? Um, yeah, I'm not sure how you are forgetting it. Could you could you yes, maybe yes, just yes. say one or two words more? Yes, yes. I'm. I'm that. Thank you, Arkady. I'm, I'm forgetting because there is a, a general uh, a general phenomena that. Uh, there are always, if there is a winning strategy, then it's, it's local. So you can actually forget about the history. I don't know if, if this is a general fact of, on, about topological games or, or in a more restricted uh, category of games, but um, you can also do all the, all, everything without this result. So you can also 
remember all the all the history but but here it's just more more convenient to work with with the local uh, version but uh, I'm, what what I'm not forgetting is the b0 so so the b0 for example prime here is is really the b uh, 0 1 2 3 so really it is the the b3 of the original game so this I'm not forgetting just in the notation I'm not I'm not uh, Showing this, so it might okay. be that, it's just, that this winning strategy is subgame perfect, and therefore it is uh, oh, it is winning in every position. So all you need to know is the current position, which is the current set that you are in. Yes, yes, that, that's how it's called. You're right. It's called positional uh, strategy. I'm not completely sure uh, how to how to prove this or why why this is true, but this is a general fact, which is very useful, and was proved by by Schmidt in his uh, sixty five paper. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to, I want to do is I want to show you an example of of a winning set and how it is useful, but. In order to do this, it is it is more convenient to work with with a more uh, evolved or more recent uh, game that was invented by by McMullen uh, in two thousand and nine, I guess. <clears throat> and that's the absolute game. And the difference is that uh, he called it absolute because it, it doesn't involve the alpha. It only has one parameter, beta. So basically, now Alice and Bob, they still choose balls, but the, the rate in which they, the balls decrease um, is the same. And the difference is that, um, uh, wait. Um, now Bob has to choose a ball that doesn't intersect, that is away from Alice's ball. So. So if I, okay, yeah, you don't need this, but if I draw this, then this is B0, uh, this is A1 uh, of radius beta times R0, and then this is B1. And the game goes on inside the, inside B1. So this is A2 and this is B, B2 and so on. Uh, and the game still ends in a point. Ah. The game still ends in a point. And this will be the outcome, and everything everything is uh, basically the same. Um, you can define the set well here. here. McMullen worked in in R n, but really you can you can define this for every for every metric space, every complete metric space on in with one cost. The absolute winning sets will not necessarily be large if the space is uh, is small, but uh, so you need you need the space to be to have some to have enough points in order for for absolute winning sets to be to be large. But mm -hmm. you can still define you define this you can define the notion on over every met, complete metric space. Yeah. What is the motivation to call it absolute winning? Absolute. Yeah, I just said it. That. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, I was thinking at the, the same time of what was on the slide, so probably I missed it. Sorry, but you don't have to repeat it. Okay. I'm yeah. Just listening sorry, and sorry. thinking uh, simultaneously. So. Okay. okay. Sorry. No, but really, really, I really appreciate every every question because it allows me to to talk more. So uh, about the point. The point. So, uh, really, there is one very useful. Um, property of of winning set is that uh, if if s is yeah uh, if s is uh, alpha winning ah sorry about this if uh, if s is uh, alpha win alpha winning then you can apply an f is uh, some Lipschitz b Lipschitz function uh, b Lipschitz oh no or if I mess this out, then then um, f of s or f f of s is uh, alpha prime, basically 
I think it should be divided by this, uh, well, Lipschitz, fun Lipschitz constant uh, square, alpha, alpha prime, alpha, alpha divided by the Lipschitz constant uh, winning. So the, so this is a bit uh, frustrating because it doesn't allow you to, to use the countable intersection property for infinitely many images of, a, of an alpha winning set because if the, if the parameter shrinks, it is true that uh, if alpha pro yeah, if this is smaller than alpha, then uh, if if this is smaller than alpha, then then an alpha winning set is also is also alpha over m squared set uh, m squared winning. So you can you can have the finite intersection property, but uh, but if you have infinitely many images, then you cannot have the the countable intersection property. And in the absolute game, there is no there is no alpha, so so you can in fact, get the, the stronger result that uh, absolute winning sets um, are preserved by Bilipschitz functions. So, so it's just, it just a, ni a nicer uh, game, but uh, I don't know if this is the best name. It has some reason. He had, he had some reason to call, this, call it this way. Okay, so ah, so here there is um, another subtlety that um, um, yeah, that wins by default. So so if the space is not large enough, it might be the case that um, there is a ball in which uh, all the all the set is concentrated in in a smaller ball, and then Alice can choose this set and uh, the game will end because Bob will not be able to choose a point from the, from the set, from the space. But then this is not interesting. So, so in this version of, of the definition, uh, which is slightly different from, from what McMullen used, uh, we allow this and we just, uh, we pay the price of absolute, absolute winning sets might not be large. So if, if the space is small and Alice can just win by, by default all the time, then uh, being absolute winning is not such a, such a it, it can be an empty set even. So it only, it's only true, okay, here, here it is. So it's only true, so this is the definition of uh, what, do I, what I mean by the space being large. So a subset of a, of a metric space is called the uh, diffuse. If, uh, if there is some um, radius and a, and, a, and, a, and a parameter beta such that, okay, let me draw this, such that uh, whenever you have a ball around X, no matter uh, what point, what other point Y you take, let's say this is Y, it can, it can even be not in K. So no matter what other point, there will always be a point Z, so this is X, there will always be a point Z in the space in, the, in K, such that the ball around, the, the smaller ball around the Z is inside the bigger ball around the X, but do not intersect the smaller ball around Y. So this is what I, this is, this definition is, is really adjusted to the, to the game, but, but really it's a, it's a general, uh, it's equivalent with, with some uh, difference in the parameters to being uh, what is called uniformly perfect. So, so it's, it's a kind of a uniform definition on, on being perfect, on being, on having another point from the set uh, in, in the near any point in the set. Uh, and now it's very, it's not hard, it's not difficult to see that the uh, absolute winning in, in, in uh, diffuse sets imply uh, winning. So, so we, we, don't, we do not lose anything if we work with the absolute winning. On the contrary, we also, we also uh, gain something. So one of the motivations uh, was exactly this. Ah, 
And maybe maybe I can give you yeah I can give you the the example you should have in mind for a diffuse set is the cantor set so is the middle thirds cantor set so uh, you see that uh, in every ball so if the if the ball was uh, you know uh, on the level the, on the scale of some uh, level n level n of the construction and beta, for example, was one third, then um, you see that uh, there, are, uh, there is some separation. So it's not true that uh, the, everything that is contained in this interval is, is, uh, in, is already contained in a smaller interval. So, so this is the example you should have in mind. And one of the motivation was to understand the intersection for introducing the, the absolute game was to understand the, the intersection of those uh, natural sets that appear in number theory, in number theory and dynamics with the Cantor set, for example. So this is a, an ongoing uh, research in, in number theory and dynamics to understand this uh, for, for natural, sub, for natural uh, fractals. And here there, are, there is actually, so here also you see the connection to, to this conference maybe, or this summer school where um, you, you actually also get the, the, the converse. So, so there is a nice characterization. What, you, what is not true about uh, winning set, winning uh, like alpha winning sets where there is no other um, characterization that I'm aware of, of, of alpha winning sets, here there is an actual characterization of uh, absolute winning sets. So those are the, at least for Borel sets. So at least if the game is determined on, on S, really it doesn't matter that it is Borel. It, it, it matters that uh, the game is determined on S, then this characterizes the, uh, the property of being absolute winning. So I don't know. Should I prove this? This is this is uh, somewhat in the spirit of the of the training school. And uh, uh, one direction is very easy. Uh, let me try this. So one direction uh, where you try to prove that. Uh, so if S is uh, absolute winning. Uh, assume, yeah, assume S is absolute winning and, uh, and the K in X is uh, diffuse. Diffuse and non-empty and closed. Then, since it's non-empty, there is a, there is a, a point. So so let uh, there is a, there exists some x zero in k, and uh, Alice. Well, the set is absolute winning. So so no matter what Bob is doing, we can uh, make sure that uh, Alice can win. So for example. Let's say Bob chooses uh, B zero to be the ball around uh, X zero with some with some radius. Let's say this this radius comes from from being diffuse, right? So if the set is diffuse, then there is some radius from which from which uh, from that radius and on. Whenever you have a big ball, it's not concentrated on small balls. So let's say this was Bob choose Bob choice, and then, well, uh, what we are trying to prove is is that um, we are trying to prove that S intersects. Oh, we are trying to prove that S intersects K, right? So just uh, play according to Alice's winning strategy. And make sure that uh, also you get a sequence of uh, of uh, balls which which are centered in K. But this is exactly what what you can do. So so let's say uh, A one is uh, Alice's choice. Alice's um, move. So this is this is a local 
we can think of it as a local as a local game or a positional game. So Alice Alice sees B zero. The strategy tells her next move is A one. So Alice says move according according to a fixed uh, winning strategy, which we fixed we, we fixed in the beginning. So so then there is. Uh, so since since uh, since uh, k is diffuse, um, there exists, or yeah, k is diffuse. There exists some some z uh, in k such that uh, this ball around z of radius beta times r zero is contained in the ball around x zero minus the ball minus this a one. So let let this be b one. So and the, and let this be x. Well, no matter what it is. Bob's next next ball. So uh, you see that if you if you continue in this way, you get you get a sequence of balls that are centered in in the, in the fractal, but are also played according to a fixed winning strategy of Alice. So so they must. The, the intersection must be in K because, because it's closed. And it must be in, uh, in S because it's, it's, uh, it's the outcome of the game that is played by, according to Alice's strategy. So this is one direction. Um, yeah, the second direction, I'm not sure if this is very interesting. Maybe to go back to this uh, uh, in the end, if we have time. Uh, what do you think? Arias, you mentioned uh, that um, there's a connection to uniformly being uniformly perfect. So is one stronger than the other? Thanks. I think they are, uh, yeah, I think they are equivalent, but just uh, there, is, uh, there is slightly different parameter that we're using. Uh, I mean, you can, you can either want a, a whole ball to be disjoint, or maybe you want just another point uh, outside the ball. So this, this is the type of difference between the definition. Okay, so now I'm ready to give you the first uh, application, or the first uh, natural example of uh, of uh, what how am how, how am I on time? Uh, yeah. So the natural example is the set of badly approximable numbers. So maybe some of you are feel feel comfortable with this definition uh, that uh, these are all the real numbers that are far away from rationals. Uh, how far? Um, they are far. They are uh, so. So in Dirichlet theorem, there is uh, infinitely there are infinitely many approximations that are better than the denominator squared. And here, uh, I'm just asking that um, up to a constant, it's it's the best you get. So so that's equivalent to being um, a number, a bounded type number. Uh, so if you if you look at the continued fraction expansion of x, then you just want the digits to be bounded. And here I just put you put uh, this nice picture of uh, rational numbers in in the unit interval with all the rationals of denominators smaller than 20. So you see that uh, some rationals, uh, uh, they uh, push away other rationals, like, uh, like, like the rational zero. There are no, the, the closest to it is, is, I guess, is one over 20. Uh, where other rationals, they may be, you know, if, if the rationals have small denominator, they push away uh, other rationals further. Uh, but it's, so it's not, it's not a uniform thing. And then the, the set of badly approximable uh, numbers is somehow concentrated in the white areas, in the areas where in order to see more Rationals, of course, there are more rationals because it's dense. But if you if you want to see them, you have to look further. 
and then uh, you have to increase the denominator and then uh, you may still get, since the approximation here depends on the denominator, you may still get points that are far away from, the, from every rationale. Um, okay, so, so what am I doing now? So, so this is, a, this is a, a small set. So almost every number is not badly approximable, but it is, a, it is a, an absolute winning set. So let me try to sketch the proof of this. Um, okay, so let beta be some number and, uh, and B zero be Bob's first move. So I'm going to show to you that there is a, a strategy for Alice to make sure that uh, she's far away from, from rationals and um, she's going to have to choose some some C, so, so uh, fix some um, uh, C that depends on, on beta and R0. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see exactly how it depends uh, later. And then what Alice will try to do is uh, uh, she's going to try to to get to uh, stay away from rationals with the denominators that are between some two powers um, that are in certain in certain range in every step of the game. So she's going to do it one one step by by one step, and then uh, let's say. Let's say, uh, and I guess I also choose uh, uh, choose some range, choose some Q. This will be the range, and then try uh, as, assume the, uh, that uh, 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 that uh, Bn <coughs> do not intersect uh, the balls around uh, the rationals uh, is empty for every uh, P over Q with Q that is, that is smaller than Q to, Q to the N. So here is my claim. In the next step, I'm going to want to deal with all the rationals that are between Q to the N and Q to the N plus one. And the claim is that there is just one, one of those. So if, if I chose C and Q correctly, then, then there is a, just one point. So, so, so if uh, there exists at most, uh, one p over q with q between uh, in the next range between q to the n and q to the n plus one such that the balls around the ball around the p over q of, of radius uh, c over q squared intersects uh, bn so, oh, and the proof is very easy of this claim. And you just notice that uh, if, if P over Q, yeah, if, if, if uh, let's say P over Q, C over Q squared and uh, B, P, P prime over Q prime, C over Q squared, Q prime squared uh, intersect, intersect PN, then, uh, then the distance between P over Q and Q and, and the P prime over Q prime, well, let's say, let's say P over Q, P over Q, uh, 
so I know this. Let's say if P over Q is different than P, P prime over Q prime, then the distance between them, on one hand, it's, it's bounded below by one over the denominator, the common denominator, which is bounded below since uh, and Q prime and Q are between Q to the N, Q to the N plus one. So uh, one over, so it's bounded by below by uh, one over Q to the two N plus one, two N plus two. On the other hand, since uh, using the, just the triangle inequality and uh, well, <clears throat> And this picture, uh, so if you have, you have uh, let's say this is Bn, and this is the ball around uh, P over Q, and this is the ball around uh, P prime over Q, then the distance between those two, those two, those centers is at most twice the radius of Bn plus the radius of the, 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 the radiuses of the balls. Uh, so this is uh, at most C over, Q squared plus C over Q prime squared plus uh, beta N plus, sorry, uh, beta to the N R zero. So now if we, if we, first of all, yeah. Okay, wait. Uh, so the next thing will be, so this is smaller than uh, two times C over Q to the two N plus beta to the N R zero. So if we choose, if we choose Q to be um, beta to the, yeah, if we choose beta to be Q to the minus two. So cho choose B to be, uh, Q to be better to the minus half, then this is just, uh, this, this equals to, well, two times, right? Two times the radius of the ball. So this is uh, better to the, well. Uh, two times C plus, plus R zero, Q to the minus two N. And then if, if this constant was, uh, so we got, in the end we got uh, two times C plus R zero, Q to the minus two N is bigger than uh, Q to the minus two N plus two. So if, if this constant was smaller than uh, Q squared, then this is impossible. And uh, it's not a problem to make sure that uh, those constants are, uh, yeah, th this, is, this is beta to the n and this is beta to the n plus one. So after beta is chosen, we can still choose uh, the constant C to be, let's say smaller than uh, beta over four. And uh, R zero is, not a is never a problem because we can just, um, we can just uh, assume without loss of generality that R zero is is whatever is is small is uh, is small because we can just play as Alice. We could just play uh, play the game until R zero becomes small and do nothing, just uh, choose randomly. So so we can assume that R zero without loss of generality uh, R zero is smaller than than let's say um, beta over. over four. And uh, then we can choose uh, uh, C to be smaller than, uh, or even uh, smaller than a beta over four as well. And then this, 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 this would make, mean this is impossible. impossible. Okay, so in the end there are, uh, there is just one dangerous rational point in, in BN 
and this is going to be the rational point that uh, Alice will choose in order to, to win the absolute game. So re remember that she has to choose a ball of radius beta to the n plus one R zero. Uh, so we just need to make sure, need to make sure that uh, beta to the n plus one R zero is bigger than And this constant over Q squared for uh, for this rational, so for for Q that is uh, in this range. Uh, but this is this is easy because this is um, this is possible. So just just to make sure that uh, this constant is uh, is small enough. Okay. I'll, I'll, I hope this was not too much, uh, this didn't take, this took uh, just 10 minutes. So I'm not very concerned about your uh, attention, but now I'm going to, so are there any questions about this proof? Could you go uh, back? I'll... Could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, thanks. I had in mind to give you another uh, another proof of another set uh, being absolute winning, but I'm going to skip that. So <laughs> I'm just going to mention it, but uh, without giving you the full details. Um, okay, but this is great because we get we get for free that, for example, there is a badly approximable number in the Cantor set, which is uh, natural to expect, but it's not so obvious to, either you have a, like a, a, a nice construction of such a number or, uh, or it's not a trivial fact. And also what we get is, uh, is this uh, corollary, which was one of the motivations uh, to introduce all this uh, game theory uh, using this uh, invariance under uh, Bilipschitz maps, or, or even differentiable differentiable maps, you get that uh, there is some number that it and and all its powers are, are badly approximated. Well, may, maybe this is trivial, but uh, there is some non-algebraic number, so that satisfies this. And this is this is non-trivial. So the, there are some algebraic numbers, a quadratic irrationals that satisfy this, that are easy to show that they satisfy this. But uh, but there is uh, there is an absolute winning set. So algebraic numbers are are, um, are countable. So so there is a. So this is another nice result. And uh, I promised you also applications in in dynamics. So. Here is a very natural subset of a very natural uh, dynamical system uh, that is absolute winning. So, so it's very, to me, it, it is very surprising that uh, only now, very recently, uh, we have the right language to, to describe the, the, the largeness of uh, of this type of set, so so think of the times two map module one. So you just take a number, uh, multiply it by two, and then take module one, 
and so on. You got you got a sequence of numbers in the in the, in the unity interval, let's say, and then uh, you're asking, are there orbits? Are there numbers whose orbit do not come to a neighborhood of zero? Some neighborhood of zero, and obviously, uh, it's not a common. It's not a it's not a common property. So almost every number will have a will have a dense orbit under the time two map, but uh, there are orbits that that are that uh, do not satisfy uh, that do not come close to to zero, and this set is uh, is absolute winning. And I'm not going to show you the proof unless you you really insist. Really, the proof is very is very similar. You you show that in every range of uh, of uh, multiplication of of two to the n, there are at most there is at most one uh, dangerous one problem that can appear, and then this is this is going to be what Alice said. Right, those those intervals that you're going going to want to to be away from, you want to be away from those type of uh, rationals. Like balls of balls of this form for for some for some constant uh, c and uh, you show that there in every range in every scale there is one there is just one problem. Um, and then you get you get also you get this nice corollary that uh, there are. There are orbits that, uh, if you take, if you choose randomly, countably many points in the unit interval, even let's say even a dense set, then there are orbits that. Uh, what do I think? Yeah, yeah, because <coughs> because the constant the constant may change, but uh, so for for every for every point in K, there will be a constant such that you stay you stay far away from from uh, that point. There will there will be a CK that you stay away from from that. Obviously, you cannot stay away from from every point. From a neighborhood of k, if if k was dense, but if uh, if the constant depends on on the point, then you can stay away from every point in k. Okay, hopefully I, I didn't confuse you. Um, so let me know if there are any questions now. Before I go to describe another another game. Also, another option is to take a 10 minutes break and then come back for uh, another 15 minutes. Well, I have a question. Okay, so if, <laughs> if, if K is the set of rationals, how can you stay away? Yeah, this is what I was confused about, but uh, I was puzzled about. But in, for, every, for every point in the rationals, you stay away from, from the point in, in the rationals with a different constant. Okay, so, so, so this, this, is nice, this is a uh, nice uh, exercise in, in topology, right? Uh, to okay. to okay. see that there is a there is an open set that contains the rational the rationals, but it's not everything. Okay, so so the set on the left is closure of two n two to the power n times x. This cannot have a non-empty interior, right? Obviously, otherwise. Wait. Uh... The I interior it, of the set on the left, the two yeah, I think power it can, n times x must have empty yeah, interior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's that's yeah. the situation I'm talking about. It, it can ah, have an okay, empty okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. interior. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. It can have an empty interior. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, right? You you can describe this set very easily if you have the you know the, the base two expansion of, of x, right? So, for example, yes, yes, it's very staying away from zero is just very similar to to not having uh, having boundedly many consecutive zeros uh, in that. That's extension. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yes. up to yeah. up to yeah up to being uh, close to zero from the other side uh, it's the same yes okay cool yeah yeah okay now i understand a bit better okay thanks sure okay so so the the chance to to get to get away with the with the break uh, you didn't uh, took it we didn't take it but uh, maybe i'll still i'll still finish in 15 minutes uh, um but this is this part is important to to Elon because uh, he was a bit uh, worried that i'm going to only talk about games with the um, with winning or losing and, and not mentioning any any values so so here here's a way to get a value also in the absolute game so so now we have this is like a way to quantify uh, the absolute game with another parameter alpha but here the parameter is not used to to, to the to Uh, facilitate the the shrinking uh, the rate of the shrinking but it's used to where it is to say how many inter how many balls alice is allowed to remove so so if alpha is zero this is just the absolute game she's allowed to remove just one ball but here she's allowed to remove um, beta to the minus alpha so Again, we have this problem if the if the space is not large enough and there are no beta to the alpha balls uh, in in a big ball in a big ball then then it's not an interesting property but uh, otherwise it's it's very interesting. It's it's not so trivial to 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 show the that's an exercise I don't know how to do this I I have a way to to see this but the exercise is to. So show the countable uh, intersection property for such for such uh, intersection. Maybe this follows from some general uh, principles in in game theory, but uh, it's not so easy to do this uh, by hand. That uh, okay. So what is the definition definition? So yeah. So again, the the set is winning if uh, if Alice can make sure that the game ends in is Alpha Canto winning if the, if Alice can make sure that the game ends in S or or she wins by default, and then it's not so easy to show that uh, it's absolute. It's a, it has the countable intersection property. So if Alpha is zero, then this is very this is easy because this, then the same the same proof works. But if uh, the same proof that we used for the for Schmidt's game, but if alpha is not zero, then then Alice would have to erase in the first. Uh, she would have to raise um, more and more balls, like uh, a multiple of beta to the minus alpha. So it's not not clear anymore that uh, she can do with beta to the minus alpha, but she can. So so this is not trivial. And, and again, there is an nice characterization of uh, of those uh, winning counter winning sets for Borel sets at least. So, so this definition doesn't appear anywhere, but in the literature. But uh, <clears throat> I think it's nat natural to define a generalization of what it means to be diffuse. So you know, now you have this alpha diffuse. And the difference is that you can erase uh, the ball. It's not possible to cover uh, big balls with beta to the minus alpha small balls. Uh, you need more than beta to the minus alpha balls. The, if you just use beta to the minus alpha, then there is another ball. So this is again the this this fits like a glove to the to the definition of the game. So if the if the game if the if a set is winning on a on a alpha, if a set is alpha winning on a, on a, on an alpha diffuse uh, space, then then it's large. Then it's at least not not empty, but it is it is large. Um, and there is a, a characterization of uh, alpha counter winning sets using uh, this intersection property with the alpha prime 
diffuse subsets for every alpha prime. So this, this part is very easy. Uh, it's like the same. Um, if, if the set is alpha Cantor winning, then it intersects every alpha prime diffuse set with alpha prime bigger than alpha. And the converse follows from the the terminacy, the terminacy of, of the game on, on Borel sets. So if you if you intersect every every fractal k with which is diffused alpha prime diffused for some alpha prime bigger than some alpha, then you are controlled. Um, and let me finish with this uh, two generalizations of the of the of the classical applications that we saw earlier. So you can you can try to approximate real numbers by algebraic numbers of degree d, and then if if d is one, then this is just uh, the height is just very close to being the denominator of the rational, and then the algebraic numbers of degree one are, are rational. So so you're you're away from rationals up to a constant over the denominator squared. And if d is bigger than one, then you get another interesting definition. This, it takes some time to see that this is the right definition, but, uh, but it is. And then uh, in a paper with uh, Viktor Beresnevich and, and Lei Yang, we proved that uh, this set is absolute winning. So for every d. So it means that uh, for every d, that there is this, d, from this is, it follows that there is a badly approximable, a, a real number that is badly approximable by algebraic numbers of every degree. So, so it's, it's absolute meaning in every degree and then you can take the, the countable intersection. Uh, so this generalizes the, the classical result and uh, in another direction, you can think of orbit closures of the times two map that avoid the fractal set. So earlier we had here uh, some, we could do this with countable intersections with the countable sets, but here this is really a generalization of that. So no matter what is, uh, what is K, if you are trying to avoid, if you look at, on all the orbits that all the, num all the real numbers in the, in the unit interval Whose, whose times two orbit avoid orbit closure, avoid the, that set, then it's uh, dim K counter winning. So if, if K is the house of dimension of K, and um, alpha is the house of dimension of K, then, then you, can, you can do that. You can, you can get away, you can, you can yeah. Get away from from neighborhoods of points in K uh, by removing just uh, beta to the minus alpha balls where alpha is the dimension of K. So, so for example, you can take uh, if if dim K if dim K yeah uh, if K is K is countable uh, then dim K is zero. But uh, you can take this is not true. So you can take uncountable un uncountable sets as well, whose whose half dot dimension is zero, and then you can get away from from those type of sets as well. Uh, okay, this is uh, this is everything I wanted to say. Th thank you for uh, being here. Still, thank you, Erez. Actually, you have some time. Still, you started later and. You finished earlier, so if you would like to say something, then it's welcome, more than welcome. Um, yeah, I can show you the proof uh, <laughs> uh, about uh, the proof that I skipped, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll wait for more questions if you have. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. So questions, remarks, or remarks or questions? Can you just uh, remind us what's the house stuff dimension of a set? Um, well, I don't want to give you the definition, but uh, it's it's the it's it's uh, it quantifies uh, coverings of of uh, the set K. So if you it it quantifies how many how many balls you need to cover 
uh, the set K. So, well, uh, okay. For example, for example uh, the dimension of the dimension of the Cantor set or the middle third Cantor set is is uh, log two over log three. Okay. Um, because you just need the uh, you just need two to the n balls of radius three to the minus n. Uh, ah, in order okay. To so cover, it, in order it, to cover uh, the Cantor set. It's normalized by the by the radius. Okay. Okay. So yes. yeah. Okay. So it's okay. Quantifies the 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 rate at which the this this number goes. The logarithmic rate to which this number goes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, but but there are there are many open problems about uh, those type of questions, and uh, really, what I tried to convey in this talk is is that uh, those two new results are actually mainly an, uh, a better and mainly come from a better understanding of uh, of the game theory that is involved in in. Uh, in those uh, constructions and I mean um, less less so uh, in the in the number theory and dynamics. Uh, you mean that ideas from game theory have in these recent results? So so it you you so mean that uh, ideas from game theory helped uh, the new results in this field? Um, in, in, in a crucial way, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, th these two results. Uh, so this this result, is especially, the way we prove it is is we we play the the can well, we use this characterization uh, that that we saw earlier of this characterization of of Cantor winning sets. As uh, those sets that intersect every every large enough set, so and this this um, was not known in in 2011, for example, uh, to the people who well even in the ca case alpha equals zero, it, it, it was uh, not known to them that this characterizes uh, the uh, the winning the counter winning property or the absolute winning property. Uh, and it was it was mainly revolutionized by by many people, but uh, David Simmons was was uh, a key a key uh, player, and he I guess he knew he knew some game theory. Uh, he 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 knows a lot of things, but uh, he also knew some game theory. So it will not be surprising to me if if there is some other great games that are involved in. That way to be invented in order to to be useful for applications uh, that are interested interesting in in number theory and dynamics. Thank you. Thank you, Eres. How large is the community about uh, that are working on this type of applications? Can you express it in any? Way that uh, any, it, any uh, integer, <laughs> in any it's, non, it should be approximable, yes, <laughs> and non, non offensive way. Well, yeah, we I'm very happy to, to see the your community and uh, to know about uh, people are, who are interested in, in game theory and uh, in infinite games. Uh, uh, yeah, there are, there are quite a few people uh, working in this field. Yeah, already, those people. Uh, that I mentioned in the talk are uh, like ten people, and uh, they have students, and uh, and uh, you know, McMullen uh, McMullen was involved at some point, so so this was uh, this is an interesting topic. Harris, I already asked many questions. I hope you don't mind uh, one one more. Um... Uh, if you go back uh, to the definition of the alpha DPUs set. Um, uh, go back. Alpha diffuse. Ah, yeah, I need to go back. 
wait, what am I doing? No. I think you have to move, yes, forward. Thanks. Well, my question is, um, it looks a little bit related to Alpha's dimension. Actually, yeah. I, I may be completely off, but it looks like an upper no, no. bound or a lower bound on the Alpha's yeah. dimension, something like this. Yeah, yeah. it's completely uh, equivalent. Well, this property is a, this property is a completely has a completely equivalent uh, description if you just use the support of alpha regular measures. So every 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 alpha diffuse set supports a, an alpha regular measure with a dimension bigger than alpha. And uh, I guess uh, the support of every alpha regular measure with a with an exponent alpha has a subset that is uh, alpha alpha diffuse or, or maybe for every alpha prime that is smaller than alpha or something like this. But uh, in terms of intersection with, with those support supports or diffuse sets, this is equivalent because of this property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. This is actually what we what we used. We there was some techniques in, in diophantine approximation that worked for, there is some trend in, in diophantine approximation to replace results about uh, the Lebesgue measure with results about every other measure or some other natural measures. And then there are some techniques that, that uh, allow you to, to quantify uh, me measures that are measures of neighborhoods of rationals, which with measures that are not, not Lebesgue, not necessarily Lebesgue, and then this is what we used uh, to prove some of the theorems. Okay. And thank you very much again. I stop.